our next speaker will be uh, my colleague Osa Gren, and uh, she works also at the Bayer Institute, and she is an e ecologist. Please welcome up, Osa. And she has focused on sustainable development through quantification and valuation of ecosystem services and the importance of biodiversity for building resilience. And also has been moving into to the urban context uh, in the recent years. And she's also a theme leader of the urban social ecological team at the Resilience Center. So, welcome. Thank you very much. <clears throat> First, that I'm, I'm honored to be here to talk today, and uh, it's a very happy occasion for us uh, with the prize being given to Gretchen. She was actually my co supervisor when I was a PhD student. Um, so, we're very proud of you, Gretchen. Uh, today, I thought I'd take the opportunity to talk to you about urban ecosystem services for sustainable development from local to global scales. And Gretchen talked a lot about different cities and what's going on there, and I will talk some more about that. Uh, because the urban issue is something that is very much on the agenda today. And I'm sure that you're all aware of the fact that the majority of the human population now lives in urban areas. And the pressure uh, from urbanization uh, is huge. And the predicted urban growth is a very big challenge, but also a very big opportunity for us to maybe change the trajectory that a lot of cities are on today. Uh, so I thought I'd talk to you about a UN uh, uh, project that has been initiated and actually launched that's called the Cities and Biodiversity Outlook, the CBO. Uh, and this is a global assessment of the links between urbanization, biodiversity and ecosystem services. Uh, and it was actually launched uh, this October in Hyderabad in India and at the same time in London where I take, took care of the launch. Um, so the action and policy documents and the scientific chapters to back this up are actually available on the net right now. They're free, so you can go in and download them as much as you want. Uh, but the principal message of the CBO, and I thought that Ban Ki-moon said this very well, uh, it is that urban areas must offer better stewardship of the ecosystems on which they rely. Urban areas, as you all know, depend on a lot of resources, a lot of ecosystem services, both within the urban area themselves, but also from the outside, of course, to a very great extent. But including uh, the generation of multiple ecosystem services. So the lens of ecosystem services in this context has been uh, very productive and very useful. Uh, so the mission of the CBO, it serves as the first global synthesis on how urbanization impacts biodiversity and ecosystem change. And it also tries to provide uh, an overview of the gaps, the knowledge gaps that we face in order to, in a more sustainable way, uh, take charge of this urban global, uh, urbanization that we are, are facing today. And also, a thing that I find very uh, encouraging in the CBO that is that the focus is very much on solutions. Yes, of course, we do have uh, information and knowledge of the fact that we are in a serious situation, but the, the, the focus on the solution uh, makes this a much more productive way, I think, to face these challenges. Uh, but going back to the knowledge gaps, like Gretchen talked about the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that you all probably know of, uh, was a fantastic attempt to try and, and look at the status of the ecosystem services uh, on the planet, where we found that 60% of them are being used unsustainably or are being eroded. But there were very few references made to, to urban areas in the, in the MA. Uh, and on the other side of the spectrum, if you look at the World Development Report, from the World Bank, which is the world's largest assessment of urbanization. Very few references are made to ecosystems at all. So there is a gap here that needs to be filled, and we are trying to contribute with this by uh, this CBO uh, project. So the CBO uh, comes out with 10 key messages. And as I said before, they are very much focusing on solutions. So for example, rich biodiversity can exist in cities. 
and maintaining functioning urban ecosystems uh, is very much connected to human health and well-being. And this is, these examples and these key messages are based on uh, scientific knowledge, but also from examples from the real world. And here you have the rest of them, and they have to do with the fact that cities also have the possibility to uh, act as learning arenas. Uh, and Gretchen talked about the fact that we need good examples, we need tools, we need methods, and we need to share them amongst us. And we also, there is a bit of pressure for time to do this. We need to, to move rather quickly. But I thought I'd give you some examples from all over the world within the CBO network that has uh, a lot of, of cities and, and people and uh, organizations attached to it to see where these key messages come from. So I thought I'd give you some, some examples. And for example, key message four that has to do with maintaining functioning urban ecosystems uh, in the connection to human health and well-being. Uh, so there are now scientific research supporting the fact that we actually do uh, feel better if we have green areas around us, especially in urban areas. So the percentage of green space uh, inside a three kilometer radius from home had a significant positive re relation to perceived general health. We now have the scientific knowledge. I mean, this is sort of common sense for my, many of us, but you need to, to show it scientifically in order for it to uh, be included in policies and in decision making when you are taking uh, decisions on where to direct this urban uh, development that we are facing. Another really interesting study comes from England where they found that a significant association between residents in most green areas, this is also an, an, an equity issue, I think, <laughs> are, um, and decreased rates for all cause and circulatory mortality. So you can actually see that you avoid uh, illness when you are located in areas where you have green around you. Uh, this is an interesting example that's very, very specific. It has to do with the fact that on our skin we have uh, bacteria that provide us with anti-inflammatory molecules. And these bacteria reside in green areas, in, in trees and in, in grasslands. Uh, and if you are far from these areas, you will get a decrease in these bacteria on your skin. So the, the risk for you to have an, an inflammatory reaction actually increases, which is kind of interesting, I think. Uh, another key message has to do with what Gretchen was mentioning also, the fact that we are uh, facing uh, uh, dire climate changes. And uh, especially since, the, I don't know if you read the last report from the, the World Bank, where we actually think that we are on a much steeper trajectory towards uh, increase in temperature than we ever thought. But here, cities also, can play a role in contributing uh, to mitigating climate change. Uh, we all always hear, hear about the fact that, that the cities contribute, and of course they do, but they also have, can, can have a role in, in mitigating this. And if you look at the vulnerability of sea level rise, a lot of big cities face that. So we need to be active stewards, of people that are, are, are uh, in cities, to take care of this problem. And some of the really nice examples that are being spread through the CBO within the network, but also outside of it, is, for example, uh, the new tax that they have introduced in Yokohama to support green area expansion, where they have a goal of 30% green areas within the city, which I think is fantastic. Another climate action plan is in New Mexico, where they are going to focus on large green roof programs, but also uh, reward private landowners to restore degraded habitats, etc. So these are nice local scale examples that are being sort of uh, uh, exchanged within different cities within the network. If you look at uh, uh, key message six, this has to do with increasing biodiversity of urban food systems to enhance food and nutrition security. Uh, the fact that urban areas need so much food and that lots of it is grown outside of the city is true. And this is a, a vulnerability of cities. But also, we have the fact that uh, a lot of really big cities uh, get uh, a lot of percentage of their food from within the urban system themselves, especially in third world countries, where 70, 80, 90% 
or at least the, the vegetables can be grown within the urban area. Uh, and also in, in Stockholm, in World War I and World War II, we grew at least 10% of our food within Stockholm city. We grew food in roundabouts, in our backyards, in parks. Um, so it's a, a, a resilience aspect of this, to have these green areas when the crisis come, to actually be able to grow our food. Because the problem for Stockholm was not that we had enough food. We didn't have enough food in the surrounding areas, but we had problems getting it into the city because we didn't have any fuel. So, but these are two really nice examples, one from Uganda, where they have a program of guiding healthy urban agriculture in Kampala. But also in Cuba, in Havana, they have a long tradition of growing food in Havana because of the political situation for Cuba, where they haven't been able to import so much stuff from the out world. Uh, the last key message has to do with the fact that cities have a large potential to generate innovations and governance tools. Realizing that every city is unique with its own social and ecological prerequisites, uh, there is a big value of learning from others, not reinventing the wheel, and also doing this not only exchanging information between scientists, but also between the cities themselves. And our, uh, what we found within the CBO was that a lot of ideas, tools, and inspiration was easily, easy, easier to implement within cities on the, on the political uh, level or the scale of operation of cities than it is on maybe sometimes national level or international levels. So this is a, sort of a, a, a political uh, scale that sometimes avoid some of the, the gridlock that appears when you come up on, on higher political uh, levels. Uh, and I thought I'd, I'd just uh, end uh, by talking about what I think is one of the biggest challenges and also opportunities that we are facing today when it comes to sustainable urban development. The fact that more than 60% of the area projected to be urban in 2030 has yet to be built. It's not built. 60%. It's a fantastic window of opportunity. It's also a big challenge, but what an opportunity to use these new tools and these insights, uh, especially using the lens of ecosystem services, to use this uh, window of opportunity to maybe change or redirect uh, the, the route uh, on where cities are uh, today. So I think this is one of the biggest challenges and opportunities that we are facing today. And I think that we will definitely take this into account we have talked to Gretchen and her group about doing an urban invest module because urban systems are special. And we need this to be able to face in a good way this challenge. Thank you very much.